start the program, I'd like to give you some housekeeping information. First, we encourage attendees to use the computer audio feature of this webinar, but should you experience any interference, such as static or intermittent audio due to a busy network, you can use the optional phone connection, which is listed at the top of the presentation window where the title slide is. Second, we will have a live Q&A session during the last 10 minutes of the program. You may submit questions anytime during the program using the Q&A function in the webinar interface. If you are listening on the phone, you will receive instructions on how to ask questions later in the program. After the program, you can use the post-program question form to send program-related questions to the program's faculty. The post-program question form can be accessed from the program attendee page. Use the link provided in the confirmation email you received for this program to get there. And a final reminder, this program is being recorded. To purchase a recording of this or other ABA programs, visit the ABA web store at shopaba.org or call the ABA at 800-285-2221. Welcome to Civility and Free Expression, Developing a Public Dialogue Through the Arts, co-sponsored by the ABA Division for Public Education and the ABA Center for Professional Development. Moderating the program today is Christine Lucianic. Christine is Manager of Education Programs and Research for the American Bar Association Division for Public Education and is located in Chicago, Illinois. Christine, please proceed with today's program. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us for Civility and Free Expression, Developing a Public Dialogue Through the Arts. Before I introduce this afternoon's speakers, I will provide a little bit more information about the project that has all brought us here today. So this webinar is provided through support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and is an extension of a larger grant project titled Civility and Free Expression in a Constitutional Democracy, a National Dialogue. This webinar um, that we're talking about today is going to concentrate a little bit more about some of the things that we discovered through the original grant project. And throughout that project, the ABA worked with partners in nine different states to develop programs that looked at the tensions between civility, and free expression through a variety of different lenses, including civility and free expression in a digital age, civility in political discourse, civility and free expression in cr cross-cultural perspectives, and the relationship between civility, free expression, free speech, and hate speech. We are joined today by one of those nine partners from the Program in the Humanities, at UNC Chapel Hill. Christy Norris serves as the Director of K-12 Outreach for the Program in the Humanities, which specializes in hosting public seminars that draw upon the humanities to nurture a deeper understanding of history and culture, enrich the life of the mind, and contribute to the development of a more humane world. In this role, Christy oversees the North Carolina Civic Education Consortium, which provides unique training opportunities and materials for North Carolina's educators and students. Christy worked with playwright, actor, and director Mike Wiley of Mike Wiley Productions to develop a program at the Chapel Hill Public Library titled Talking Race in the Shadow of Controversy, which they will be sharing more about today. Mike Wiley is from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and has developed distinctive original works in documentary theater, film, educational residencies, and performances for student audiences which he performs nationally. Through his performances, Mike has introduced countless students and communities to the legacies of Emmett Hill, Henry Broxbaum, and more. Mike was the 2014 Lehman Brady Visiting Joint Chair Professor in Documentary Studies and American Studies at Duke University's Center for Documentary Studies and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are also joined today by Hallie Gordon of the Steppenwolf Theatre Company in Chicago. Hallie is Director of Steppenwolf for Young Adults. Her recent directing credits for Steppenwolf include the world premiere 
of World Set Free by Bryn Magnus, and Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, adapted by Lydia R. She is currently serving as Artistic Director for the Chicago Park District's Theater on the Lake and is on the board of the United States Center for International Association of Theater for Children and Young People. Later in the webinar, Hallie will be sharing about her involvement in Chicago's citywide initiative, Now is the Time, that brought together more than 15 of Chicago's theater companies to address youth violence. For the remainder of our time, our presenters will discuss how they have used theater as a starting point to ground conversations on contemporary and controversial issues. They will share specific programming examples, the insights and discussions had amongst audiences, and best practice strategies for developing community programming. We will be stopping throughout the next hour to answer questions, so please feel free to type them in the Q&A box on the left side of your screen. And now, Christy, I will pass things off to you. All right. Thank you, Christine. I am Christy Norris. I'm here with Mike Wiley in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It's the perfect day for a webinar. It's a very cold and gloomy, rainy day here, so we're really happy to spend this next hour with you guys. Um, as Christine mentioned, I'm the Director for K-12 Outreach for the Program in the Humanities and Human Values at UNC Chapel Hill. And as Christine also mentioned, we host all kinds of public programs from weekend seminars and lectures on all kinds of humanities related topics to book clubs to even adult spelling bees. Um, so there's a lot of variety in what we do. And my work in particular is to manage the program's outreach to K-12 teachers through its Civic Education Consortium. And this is mainly through hosting professional development and writing curriculum. So if there are any teachers here today, or if you work with any teachers, please check us out at www.civics.org, and you'll find lots of great lesson plans and things. Uh, we also host other types of special events for both teachers and the general public. And one example of that is what I'll be talking about today in our time together. So I'm especially excited about the topic of this webinar, how to integrate arts into public programming, specifically with the goal of facilitating public dialogue. This was really at the core of our program designed for the BARS Civility and Free Expression grant that Christine talked about earlier, which was called Talking Race in the Shadow of Controversy. And this was in collaboration with and held at the amazing Chapel Hill Public Library. I know that we have a lot of folks from libraries around the country with us today. And I'm so happy to see that because you guys are um, excellent uh, collaborators for this type of work. The first thing I want to do is just give you a little bit of context regarding the planning of this event. Um, just keep in mind, you know, at the time we were in the planning stages, this was back in 2013, and this was in the wake of the 2012 shooting of Trayvon Martin. At that particular point, we were in the midst of the George Zimmerman trial and, as you know, eventually acquittal. And we realized that given the theme of the grant and given the current events of that time, we had to be responsive. We had to go there. And so we devised this public program, Talking Race in the Shadow of Controversy. And our conceptual thinking here was that race is an issue, particularly racism. It's always there, but as a society, we're only talking about issues of race or racism on a large scale anyway, it seems, during and directly after a controversial event. So, a colleague and I were talking about how um, you know, racism is, is like lava. You know, in today's world, it's maybe a little bit more hidden at times compared to other points in history, but it's a lava that is underneath the surface. It's always there. It's always boiling, and then something draws out the conversation in this explosive eruption, um, you know, such as the killing of Trayvon Martin. And this um, idea of the shadow, it's not just the shadow of current events, but you know, such as the shooting of an unarmed African-American boy, but it's also the shadow of history, such as Jim Crow, um, such as slavery. And we wanted to try to bring folks together and get at these complicated and intense issues. And some of the key questions that we knew we wanted to address included in what ways does Jim Crow history still impact communities today, particularly in how we communicate and are able to express ourselves? What role does race play within the concepts of civility and free expression? And do minorities truly have equal access to free expression without consequences? So that was the goal, and it sounds like a great, dynamic, intense program, but how do you actually host and facilitate a successful event particularly when its core is going to be making a group of 
strangers basically feel comfortable discussing a traditionally uncomfortable topic depending on who you are. So we knew we had some real challenges facing us. First, discussing issues of race itself is and can be a challenge. Many people, I think, don't want to talk about race. They don't know how to talk about race. They don't understand why it's important to talk about race or any combination of the above. And keep in mind, I'm talking about 2013 and 2014 here for planning and then execution. In the wake of more recent 2015 events, I think we've heard more calls for a national conversation about race, but when you think about it, what does that even mean? How does that actually happen in a productive way? And this is exactly what we were trying to figure out you know, a few years back. And another related challenge is that racism in many ways has evolved perhaps compared to periods like Jim Crow but our language for describing it hasn't necessarily evolved. And I would also argue that a lot of the public has never had a great vocabulary or the skills for addressing race and racism really in any capacity. So that brings me to the related challenge of audience considerations. Um, partnering with the local library, again, we knew from experience, would help ensure a diverse audience, which is so crucial for an event like this, but it also meant we had to be prepared for uh, mixed groups of strangers, diverse in age and background and education and race and life experiences. And also any public event like this means you're going to get folks who are just sometimes not used to discussing issues like this or don't have the skills or the filter for how to do so appropriately. Um, you know, I think, for example, having done a lot of programs like this, you run into things um, like extreme emotional responses might be something that you worry about. Um, or one of the things I'm always hyper aware of are folks who really want to focus the conversation on expression of white guilt. Uh, Mike and I have a colleague, author Tim Tyson, who refers to this cleverly as people who come seeking their I'm not a racist badge. Um, you know, and with any discussion about any topic, there's always the danger of participants who monopolize the conversation or side rail the group. So ultimately we had the challenge of dealing with this and really figuring out how to make people comfortable enough to talk about a traditionally uncomfortable topic and in a, uh, in a productive, transformative way. So a lot of this you all already know. You know this work is hard. It's not easy. And so how do you address these challenges? Got to make sure you guys get your money's worth in this hour. So um, one of the things our program has learned along the way, I think the most crucial lessons have been you set the stage for a successful program, first and foremost, by having a rich and quality text that grounds the conversation. And what I mean by that is some type of shared reading or, in this case, shared experience that you can always refer back to throughout the discussion. I think just throwing out open-ended discussion questions without relating it to some type of text can really get you into trouble. So you always want to be able to point your audience back to the text to help you keep things from steering too far off course. It helps keep things from getting too extreme in terms of emotional responses. It really just is a way to ground you as a group and as a community. And I think we often assume text has to be a printed reading, especially those of us in the university world think a book or an essay or a chapter. But performance can absolutely be some of the best text. And I, I love performance because I think an audience is less likely to tune out. If you think about lectures or even films, after about eight minutes to ten minutes, you lose folks. In fact, looking at the clock, I hope I'm not lost you all already myself. But there's often a wall of sorts that goes up between the person who's speaking and the audience, whereas performance can be much more engaging. It literally becomes, can be a conversation with the audience itself. And so I think the audience has to be more present in that case. And for us, Mike Wiley's one man show, Darhi, The Lynching of Emmett Teal, was the perfect text. And let me just give you a little bit of background, and then I'm going to let the man who makes the magic happen take over here. But Darhi is a theatrical piece that's set in 1955 where Mike plays multiple characters, I think 36, or um, a lot of characters. And woven together, it basically recounts the murder of a little boy, 14-year-old Emmett Teal, who, as you know, traveled to Mississippi from Chicago to visit his family and was brutally murdered for allegedly flirting with a white woman. Um, you're going to see a brief clip of Darcy here in just a moment, but there are several things about this performance piece in particular I think that made it the perfect text for us um, in Talking Race in the Shadow of Controversy. First, the show, or the text, uh, it was based, it's based in the past. 
So it allows us to initially ground the conversation in past events. And not that that isn't still challenging, but I think it does provide a little bit of distance, and that distance helps folks warm up to speak even with our end goal of being to end up in the present. And there's a great, great quote by the incredible late John Hope Franklin, if the house is to be set in order, one cannot begin with the present. He must begin with the past. And I think that's very relevant here. Second, Mike is a super interactive performer. His, <laughs> the audience is a character in itself. Uh, with him, you can never tune out completely like you can with a speaker or a film or a lecture. I mean, with Mike, you never know when you might get pulled on stage to be a character yourself. And not to mention, he's one man with minimal props and minimal set pieces, so he can literally perform right there in the middle of folks. You can reach out and touch him if you want. So I think it makes for a really super connected experience for the audience. And what we're going to do now is we're going to show you a two-minute clip just to give you a sense of what Mike does and so that you can see a really small piece of what the attendees at Talking Race saw. The show is um, much longer, around an hour, over an hour, hour and a half, um, when performed in its entirety. But the clip's going to be pretty self-explanatory. Do be prepared. There's some sensitive content and language. And then afterwards, you'll get to meet Mike himself, and we can share a little bit about um, the discussion afterwards and the responses to Talking Race. So let's go ahead and show that clip now. I mean, what else could we do? He was hopeless. Now, I'm no bully. I never heard a nigga in my life. I like niggas in their place. I know how to work them. I just decided it was time a few folk got put on notice. As long as I live and I can do anything about it, niggas gonna stay in that place. Niggas ain't gonna vote where I live, because if they did, they control the government. Niggas ain't gonna go to school with my kids. And when a nigga gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living, because I'm likely to kill him. I mean, me and my folk fought for this country, and we got some rights. Now, I stood in that shed and listened to that boy throw that poison at me. Chicago nigga. I'm tired of them sending your kind down here to stir up trouble. Damn, you're gonna make you an, I'm gonna make an example just so everybody can know how me and my folks stand. JW knew there was an old cotton gin fan. So we put the boy back in the truck and went to go get him. When we got there, it was starting to get light, and J.W. was getting worried about folks seeing us steal this cotton gin fan. So we made the boy put it in the truck. Then we went up to a little spot on the river J.W. knew about. Take off your clothes. Slowly. Boy took off his shirt. Shoes. Pants. Dropped his shorts. Then he stood there, naked, and smirking. You still as good as me? Yeah. You still had white women before? Yeah. Then we uh, tied that barbed wire around his neck, attached that old cotton gin fan, and we rolled him over into the river. So um, that is what Mike does. And if you ever have the chance to go and see this show, go. Um, Mike does travel nationally. I'm giving him a little plug here because it's an incredibly powerful and moving experience. And I am going to turn it over to Mike Wiley now to tell you a little bit about what he does, how in the world he does it, why he does it, and why work like this is such great content 
for public learning and dialogue. So, Mike Wiley. Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. So, what you just saw was, in essence, um, uh, something that I wrote and uh, produced after a year of, of research and writing, and that actual clip was filmed uh, just down the road from where uh, Emmett was killed in Mississippi. So that's a piece that uh, was written and directed in the South and toured all over the South before it had its first um, production in any northern state. Um, but how did I get there? Um, as a kid, I grew up in traditional classrooms, and by traditional, I mean I was taught the Cliff Notes version of black history. That is, George Washington was the father of our country, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks did everything else. It wasn't until late in college and after that that I came to learn of the multiple layers of racism and the history of racial bias in this country. I mean, I had lived it, of course, but I had not learned it. And for a number of years, I was asked to portray roles in productions that personified the Abe Lincoln MLK abbreviated version of history, actually. Um, early on in my career, I uh, toured with uh, children's theater companies out of uh, several different states nationally. And once I even remember that uh, a director had reimagined what the story of, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus could be, and had uh, young Virginia have a best friend in this scenario. Her best friend happened to be myself, um, a, a black newsie named Freddie. And at the end of the play, um, her father told her that she needed to move. They needed to move to a different town. And once they moved to that different town, she was sad because her friend Freddie could not be there with her. Well, lo and behold, the uh, director slash writer had actually written in that Freddie, her friend, came to live with her in that town. Odd? Yes, very much so. But, as I said, um, these plays seemed uh, to be more paternalistic than productive for me. I had to ask myself the age-old question. If I am not part of the solution, am I then part of the problem? I could have simply created plays about present-day African-American life, as many fine playwrights do. I felt that in order to understand, though, in order to understand our present state of being, we first needed to understand where we have come from. And as James Baldwin so adequately, adequately put, um, for history, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. So, as a playwright, it is then from present day that I call inspiration to perform and write plays about history. The first play that I wrote was titled One Noble Journey, A Box Marked Freedom, based on the life of the slave that mailed himself to Philadelphia, Henry Box Brown. Um, I, I like to ask the audience, in a sense, what price would you pay for freedom, and, and then liken it to uh, Henry Brown's life. Uh, in creating this solo production, I found room for for humor in telling the American slave narrative, which is a way most had never experienced the story of slavery. I found in touring it around the country to schools and communities of varying racial mixes, it suddenly made talking about the issues and history of slavery easier or, as one individual in rural North Carolina put it, more palatable. I also found utilizing audience participation made the experience richer for audiences uh, to perhaps see the world and race from another perspective. 
audiences begin to make their own connections to present day issues and movements, I find that it is most interesting to see a white kid uh, stand up on stage and portray an African American slave. Um, they learn uh, in an entirely different manner. Um, whether it's the murder of James Byrd in Jasper, Texas in 1998 or the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012, the question is, how do I bring everyone into the room to discuss it? Uh, in crafting the narrative, for me, I am able to have uh, individuals of note that may have never spoke to one another or ever had a conversation or a debate, I'm able to bring them on stage. I can have JFK and Stokely Carmichael have a conversation on stage, but how do I do it in the audience? How do I have the audience have that same conversation? So what I do in my work is create the space for inclusive, productive conversations about race and the history of marginalization in this country. I do this with multiple age groups, pre-K through elderly, um, and multiple races. Now, for me, the process is as important as the message. Um, I'm deeply, deeply ensconced in, in how to make the process uh, more uh, accessible to others. Now, I, I can't say my process is scientific, but perhaps a 15-year social experiment, we might say, uh, by having one actor, myself, portray multiple races, multiple ages, and both genders, the audience, which always seeks to identify with a character, must come along on the journey with me. I mean, it's the human experience. It's why we laugh at certain comedians and cry over certain songs. We tend to see ourselves in them. Therefore, in creating a world where I am the sole actor, yet speaking from multiple perspectives and experiences, I transcend race in a sense, um, in a way that everyone sees themselves in me. Not only that, but I leave the house lights on so that they may learn from one another um, what makes one cringe and another cry. The audience becomes a family of one, as it were. Um, also, I believe uh, in keeping the house lights on for uh, other reasons. Uh, I believe that keeping the house lights on, uh, in a sense, is is harkens back to when we were kids. When we were kids, we were afraid of the dark because... Uh, we didn't know what the objects were in the dark, but once you turn the lights on, then we can understand what is there. That, that couch is, is, is just a couch. Uh, once we turn the light on when it comes to race, we start to understand one another, and we're not isolated. Um, and in the end, I made myself a seemingly unbiased moderator or arbitrator for dialogue and, um, and uh, post-performance discussion. And I know it works because you know, the comments range from the sublime, this made me feel as if I was a character or in the character's shoes, to the ridiculous, your skin color changed when you played white characters. And yes, I have gotten that several times. But that's okay, because the great illusion started as parlor tricks. The key to unlocking dialogue begins with enticing them into the space, getting them into the room. Once there, it's up to me to create the illusion of 1955 Jim Crow uh, or 19th century antebellum America, suspension of disbelief. When the curtain goes up, I start stretching and pulling like silly putty and pushing, and hopefully my audience won't leave in the same shape that they entered. Hopefully I change some hearts, change some minds. And I would say that was definitely the case at Talking Race. I think the show was incredible. I'm not saying that just because Mike is sitting right beside me. Um, but not only was the show incredibly incredible, but the harder part of the processing with the audience and having a really productive dialogue and learning experience was really incredible as well. So I'll tell you just a little bit about um, the response, the discussion that took place afterwards. We had. 120 community members in attendance at the library for Talking Race. They ranged in age from 10 years old to 80 years old. Uh, in terms of logistics, we had myself 
as the overall facilitator. Mike stayed for the discussion, which was fabulous. We also had Dr. Reginald Hildebrand on hand, who is an associate professor in the UNC Chapel Hill Department of African, African American, and Diaspora Studies, the idea being that he was there to answer any tough questions regarding historical facts in terms of accuracy. So he was basically just there on the side as a content expert. And we began afterwards by just allowing for initial reactions to the performance from folks, and then asked a few open-ended questions. Ultimately, I would say the audience really did the work for us, though. As I mentioned earlier, I think having a text based in history really allowed for the conversation to start with the focus on this past event that came up in the show. That seemed to provide a little bit of comfort and kind of almost like a warm-up for folks, but really quickly, I'd say within 10 to 15 minutes, the group moved to connections to current events. And uh, some of the main points of the conversation that have stuck with me, I would say first, black people, particularly black men, had to be very careful and aware of the way they spoke, acted, and carried themselves during Jim Crow. This is according to the audience response. Um, it was a matter of life and death during Jim Crow, how you carried yourself, how you spoke. And the audience said that ultimately the same is true today, that many in the group um, felt that black men in particularly absolutely do not have the same ability to freely express themselves as others do in today's world. Just like Emmett Teal in the 50s, um, black men and adolescents, young black men today, run the risk of being viewed as uncivil when they try to express themselves, or worse, a threat when they attempt to express themselves. And it didn't take long at all before someone in the audience made that connection to the 2012 murder of Trayvon Martin. And so interesting to me was that the bulk of our discussion from that point on was about current events and not the history. I think interestingly, the discussion ended with the focus on the ongoing struggles between black men and folks in position of power, such as police, how free expression on the part of an African American basically risks their being treated unjustly, whether it's being harassed or arrested or you know, um, harmed physically in some way. I think one of the most powerful moments for me, for I think the audience, was when um, an older black woman who was a mother shared how she has explicit conversations with her two boys about how to react to and interact with police. And that just opened up the gates from there. Other African Americans shared, sim shared similar customs and um, needs. And it was so telling for me thinking about that 2014 conversation when preparing for this webinar here in 2015, because that was a while back, before Eric Garner, before Michael Brown, before Walter Scott. So this community was able to talk about these issues openly almost two years before the country escalated to this calling for a national conversation about race. What's interesting is um, when that um, elderly woman spoke about having to have that kind of discussion, um, uh, a white woman said, you know, I have to have a similar discussion with um, my sons and <laughs> with, without any malice or anything like that, um, the elderly black woman said, no, no, you don't have to have the mm -hmm. same discussion. And now I think about that white woman and I think she probably had an experience in that moment mm -hmm. that, it, that, that rarely is able to be had. Um, and now she's able to watch the news with a clearer mm -hmm. set of eyes, you know? Yes, I think that is so true. I think the conversation as a whole really involved extreme learning, I think, on all sides. And Absolutely. a lot of listening, a lot of understanding. And so that's, that's symbiotic. That's, you know, folks feeling valued and heard, and that's other people learning. Um, so I, I think that was an, a really, really beautiful moment. And this is so important. We all need to take the time to listen to one another, to value what each other says. You know, I see you, I hear you. And even if I don't agree with you, I appreciate you and where you are coming from. You know, I think in the world of Facebook, we're losing that in this kind of political culture full of ideology and vitriol. These types of live moments are so important, and that is what art like Mike's performances can do for a group of strangers. So, you know, I think that conversation ended with folks basically arguing for the need for better training for police and others in position of power. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really lovely that folks even stayed for a while after chatting in smaller groups. And, you know, I think that's when you really see um, a powerful presentation. But, um, yeah, I think with that, we'll turn it back over to Christine. Thank you so much, uh, Christy and Mike, for sharing with us. For time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and say, Hallie, um, 
we will pass everything off to you to continue our talk on how arts can be used as a really great way to ground these types of public dialogues. And you can share more about Now is the Time Chicago with us. Great. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll, I'm just going to start by briefly talking a little bit about Steppenwolf for Young Adults. We serve over 12,000 youth and teacher and family audiences, um, uh, give access um, through Steppenwolf for Young Adults each year. And we maintain a strong ongoing partnership with 12 CPS schools as well as a wide network of civic and cultural partners that share SYA's focus on serving Chicago youth. You know, Steppenwolf for Young Adults is interested in reaching teens from all over the city of Chicago by creating work, artwork that incites in them a rigorous study of art, culture, and community that we see as crucial to helping develop strong citizens of the world. Steppenwolf Theater is unique among its peers in producing two plays each season specifically for the teen audience. Around these productions, we continually build a range of integrated activities to encourage active learning and also civic engagement, which is really important to us. Because of this, um, we started in 2012 and 2013. Um, now is the time, which was a citywide partnership with the Chicago Public Library and an organization called Facing History in Ourselves, as well as over a dozen local theaters. Um, it, this was a call to action to inspire positive change in our Chicago communities and to help give voice to youth who struggle with everyday violence in their lives. This was at a time where um, youth violence was at an all-time high, as well as um, not hearing from the youth of our community around these issues. So with this partnership with the Chicago Public Library and Facing History in Ourselves, which brought in an exhibit called Choosing to Participate, our hope was that now is the time would spur youth activism and a creative self-expression around themes of social responsibility and civic engagement. And these are some of the ways in which we hope that this, that this would happen. We had two plays in conversation. This is interesting in response to what Christy was saying about presenting the past in order to talk about the present. And with these two plays, um, The Book Thief, um, which uh, was a new adaptation by author Marcus Zusak and was the one book, one Chicago, um, so it was a city, it was on the citywide reading list. Um, this was in um, close partnership with the exhibit Choosing to Participate, which was a catalyst for conversation about the importance of participation in our community, our nation, and our world. And the book Thief, just very briefly, um, was dealing with Nazi Germany and one family's courage to hide a Jewish man. Um, Library, the Chicago Public Library, and again, the whole city was involved in creating events and activities for youth and adults um, during this period. Um, we also, for our second show, How Long Will I Cry? Voices of Youth Violence, was a partnership with DePaul University and the Creative Writing Department, as well as DePaul Peacemakers, uh, program in conjunction with Chicago Public Schools. So we had some really big partnerships that we were working along with, all of which um, had the one goal of giving youth a platform to talk about the challenges of our city and of their communities in which they were living in. So just, a, just another really brief um, uh, idea of kind of how Steppenwolf for young adults um, moves forward is our process is really simple. You know, we put the youth experience at the center of everything we do. We always ask what is happening now, and we always look to what is the immediate need in our community. And we do this in several different ways. We have over a dozen teaching artists that go out to the schools and that are directly in relationship with teachers and principals and students. And we also have a group called the Young Adult Council, which is over 20 high school students that meet with us over the duration of three 
three years once a week at the minimum in which we are able to engage with them in conversations about what is concerning to them in their communities and in their lives. And in 2012 and 2013, it was very clear um, that youth violence um, was a dominant factor in the lives of a lot of the kids we were working with, so much so that our teaching artists had challenges in the classroom uh, creating activities when students were either absent when they were in mourning because their brother, brother or father had been shot. Um, and it started to really affect across the board the work um, that we were trying um, to establish and that we were trying to um, get our kids participating in. So just to give you an estimate of how bad it was, um, it, you know, when we took when we take took a look at 2012 and 2013, this is what we found in in um, in Chicago. There were 506 murders in Chicago in 2012. That's 100 more than were in New York City, which is three times the size of Chicago. There were 200 more deaths than in US troops killed in combat in 2011. This became very clear to us that this was, that, that in order to create art, this was something that we could not ignore and that we really had to be in conversation in the best possible way with um, with partnerships that had the same mission as us. And at this time, I would say that the city was really in crisis and that as I went to different organizations, this was first and foremost the issue that they wanted to talk about. There was a lot of response in the, in the community with um, different um, articles that started coming out about youth violence. And the thing that really resonated, I think, with me at the time was the fact that nobody was interviewing um, youth around this, and they were the ones that were losing the most. And in presenting, um, sorry about that, we went back to a slide. Um, and in, in starting to really think about the work, I really wanted to have an in-depth conversation with youth. Um, and so we hired a documentarian to document this process. I'm going to show a slide that's just going to give you a tiny bit of a glimpse of what some of the youth were thinking and feeling. And Kyle, can you play this? My neighborhood is not so great. It's like, I mean, if you walk around, you'll see it's just like pictures of like gangs, the like the tagging, whatever. That's pretty much like what our neighborhood is about. When I first moved to my neighborhood about five years ago, um, the neighborhood was really bad. There, it, not necessarily bad, but there were a lot. Of, there was a lot of gang activity, a lot of boys like, fighting and whatnot. There wasn't a lot of gun violence, but there was a lot of like tension in my neighborhood. And like, yeah, you might be afraid of like. I, I'm pretty sure I speak for everybody in my community. Like, they are afraid of like getting jumped, shot at, getting um, robbed by somebody, just because they move from one street to another. They're gonna be like, we're gonna jump you. I always pray. I mean, and I'm like, please, like, let, let it be a good day. No violence. No, no death. So these these were teens that um, that were part of our group, and. Um, the, the show that we created in response to the need in the community with youth was that, um, sorry about that, was that um, they really wanted an opportunity um, to speak out about what was important to them and how they were feeling about this. In, in our partnership with DePaul University, Miles Harvey, who was a creative writing professor at DePaul, had a group of students that, 
that he and I collaborated with that went out into different neighborhoods throughout the entire city and interviewed um, people who had been affected by youth violence. And he, he and I spent two years in all different communities um, collecting stories. And there, was, um, there were many challenges to this, which if we have time, uh, I can talk further about. But the idea was that we interviewed um, politicians, we interviewed young people, we interviewed grandparents. Um, it was a wide range in which we then took over 2,000 pages of transcripts and created a play called How Long Will I Cry? Voices of Youth Violence. Steppenwolf Theater Company normally does not tour their shows around the city, but we knew right away that this was something that we had to take outside of Steppenwolf Theater. And in collaboration with the Chicago Chicago Public Libraries, we, um, we went to eight different libraries throughout the city uh, with the goal of workshops after each performance. Um, and we encourage participants to learn the process of collecting oral histories and turning them into a theatrical form. We, it, part of it was to add their own voice, their own stories and insights into the conversation, understanding the power of live performance can have on helping members of the community gather strength and create a call to action. I mean, what we found from a lot of these post-show discussions was that youth did not have a place to talk about what was happening to them. They weren't talking about it in the schools. They weren't talking about it with their families. And so we created an environment in which after they shot, saw the show, they could have an open dialogue with each other about what they were going through. And part of their interest was in writing, was in dig digital media, and was the creation of new work. And so our role was really to listen to what they needed and wanted in the conversation. So in making this work with DePaul, we went um, to the libraries. And again, here's, a, here's just a very small clip. And if anyone's interested, we can have the full length clip made available. But here is um, just a brief of what happened when we went out into one of the libraries. Uh, and here we go. We are bringing How Long Will I Cry? Voices of Youth Violence to the Humboldt Park Library, the newly opened Humboldt Park Library, and we're getting ready to start the show. And audience members and community members are starting to come in and it's getting exciting. This is a Chicago story. It's told in the voices of people who were interviewed for the production. I really hope that the arts could play a significant role in giving attention to youth violence as opposed to what we normally read in the paper or heard on the news. There were 506 murders in our town. These are the people who have been murdered in North Lawndale since 2007. I knew that the statistics were real, but I wasn't getting the personal stories, the personal narratives, and I felt that that's what theater does. My goals in life? Are we talking short-term, mid-term, or long-term? Because I figured all of them out. I think people want their stories to be told. Hallie was talking about how she wanted to do a theater piece, a documentary theater piece, but she didn't really have people to go out and do it. And then there was sort of just like this aha moment for me, but I think for both of us, that maybe DePaul students could go out and do these interviews and we could really get a sense for what was happening to people on the ground and what their real stories were. This all started with a shooting. People know what they're doing is not right. They know deep down inside it's not right, but still, that's the path they choose. I don't trust nobody in my community. I might laugh and talk to you, but I don't trust you. I carry a knife. So in, in working with Miles Harvey, who um, is also a, an award-winning journalist, you know, we were exploring what students um, how theater can serve as a kind of alternative news source, offering young people information and ideas about youth violence in a hybrid form that includes both theater and journalism. So that, uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, Studs Terkel became a big part of this conversation and how, and how the telling of stories and the capturing of stories um, is what 
grounds us in our history and makes us who we are. Um, and in talking about this and talking about what is the teen identity, we were very interested in youth empowerment and, um, and students becoming empowered by telling their own stories. And through our partnership with the library and facing history in ourselves, we were able to help transform the learning landscape by creating opportunities for youth to explore these interests. And again, this happened through um, virtual space, through web, social media, blogs. We set up a Now is the Time website in which students shared their artwork from the classroom. Um, and then we also had the physical space in which um, students gathered together at Steppenwolf, at libraries, at community centers um, throughout the city. A big portion of the youth voice was um, taken from Now is the Time uh, to Act, which was the over a dozen local theater companies that participated and brought youth to the table. And we created what was called Teens at the Table. Um, we had 15 teens involved from 12 different schools. I'm sorry, from um, over 12 different schools and four different forums that, um, that these youth created. Um, we presented them at schools. We brainstormed ideas with schools and principals and aldermen uh, on, how, um, on how to get their community involved and in response um, to what the youth were interested in. We wanted to create a way to influence policy around youth violence. That's what the youth were really interested in. And teens decided to do this through a series of tall ta town hall meetings, which took place um, at different schools throughout the city. Um, and here again is just a little snippet of what that was like. Our hope is to sort of be able to reach a solution as to how we can change the way that the city as a whole views youth violence and its acceptance of youth violence. Teens at the Table grew out of the idea that we were, you know, these institutions um, creating the citywide conversation. And the biggest component of that was youth. Finally, it could affect anyone in this room. The whole idea around now is the time was being able to give youth a platform to talk about youth violence. And these young people were saying, we need neighborhood-based conversations, conversations where teens are leading the dialogue. We need ways to engage with our civic leaders in which our voices are equally as important at the table. I really like the idea of town hall meetings. So that was, again, just a snippet. This is a much longer video that, that, that takes place um, over an extended period of time in which they met with city officials to talk about policy change. Um, and throughout um, this process, we had many different partners. We had the Department of Arts Education, Office of Curriculum and Instruction within Chicago Public Schools. We had Chicago Citizens for Change. We had Free Spirit Media, Kids Off the Block, over 21 community organizations and schools throughout um, the city um, came together this year, to t that year in 2012 and 2013, under the Now is the Time banner. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I think one of the things just really quickly that we learned is how important pre-planning was to the overall success um, of this endeavor. It was a huge success, and it was three years in the making. Um, part of what we did is we had um, a juvenile justice roundtable at the invitation of Judge Sophia Hall, which is presiding judge of the resource section of the Juvenile Justice and Child Protection Department of the Circuit Court of Cook County, and Steppenwolf brought a team of professional actors to a round table of people concerned with the issue of youth violence. Judges, lawyers, law enforcement officers, activists, and young people from all over Chicagoland were there. And the actors performed part of the six stories gathered during the research and part of the play of How Long Will I Cry? And the response was just overwhelming. Um, among others, representatives from groups um, such as Restorative Justice, 
and uh, Free Right Jail Arts came forward to ask us to present the oral histories for members of their organization. And this was prior to the project even being up and running and the production in full scale. Because of the popularity and kind of the need for this conversation, Miles Harvey um, took all the transcripts and created a book called How Long Will I Cry? Voices of Youth Violence that in a way picks up where the play left off. Um, he distributed over 25,000 copies free of charge to libraries, to um, high schools, to universities, um, to social workers. It's now in its fourth edition and um, it just keeps uh, you know, and we see now in, in the times that we live in, um, the violence has not ceased. It continues and it makes this conversation even more relevant, unfortunately, and more important to continue to have. And so with that, I, I hope there's time left for any questions, uh, any thoughts. And again, if, if people are interested in further information, I can certainly forward that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Hallie. And we do have a, a little bit of time for a few questions that um, I will direct to both you and then Mike and Christy. Um, I will let Christy, if you want to go ahead and just share a little bit more about the best practices for developing public dialogues to get, before we get to our last few questions, and then I will make sure to let everyone know where they can get the resources that were talked about today. Sure. I assume that lots of folks are probably here today because they're looking to do programs similar to these. So we thought it might be helpful just to share some of the things that we've found to be most successful. Um, first of all, and I talked a little bit about this when I spoke earlier, but base the discussion in a quality text. And remember that that text can be um, performance, that text can be um, a movie, it can be any number of things. So don't think about just traditional forms of text. Um, the other is make sure you have a trained, experienced facilitator. I think it's really crucial to have somebody there who can create a welcoming space, who sets some ground rules and expectations for the group um, throughout the event. Throughout that discussion, um, folks need to be validated. They need to feel like they're heard. So it's really important that a facilitator be able to kind of gauge the mood, to gauge the needs of the audience. Do we need to stay here for a while? Do we need to move along? Um, are we getting caught down, caught up in something? So um, really somebody that can have that relationship with this group of you know, 10, 20, for us 120 strangers. Having a scholar or expert on hand I have found to be super helpful and that's just to take some of the responsibility off of you, off of the performer, to not, you, you know, it, I'm not an expert in history necessarily, but you can get a local university person or somebody from a museum, not to dominate the discussion and to lecture, but to literally be on the sidelines to answer any tough questions that come up in terms of, in terms of facts, historical facts, since we were dealing with history. I think having diversity in your host as much as possible, I know sometimes um, this might be hard, but I think it's really important. Um, folks need to feel comfortable and they need to literally see people that look like them when they hit the door. So whether it's the director of the library, the performer, the professor, you know, I think it's important to have all different types of people there in charge of this event, you know, shaking hands at the door, welcoming people in from the smallest role to the largest role. Spatial and environmental considerations. Food is great. You know, you want to set up a community feel. So hard to be mad when you're eating a cupcake, so snacks, welcoming music, um, appropriate seating arrangements. I think this is one of the things we forget specifically with theater. I personally do not like to have a discussion about race with proscenium seating. So again, what's so great about Mike's show is we can, um, you know, make that three quarters seating and then even circle up a little bit. Um, but, you know, think about how folks are even facing one another. They need to be able to see one another and talk to one another and not just speak through one person standing up in front of them. And the last thing I would just say is market beyond your usual suspects. Get the libraries involved, the community centers, your schools if it's appropriate. Go beyond whoever your typical audience is and then you'll, you'll really set yourself up to have a more meaningful and rich and transformative experience, I would say. So with that. Thank, 
Thank you, Christy. Uh, we do have a question for Mike, which is, um, have, have you ever experienced any pushbacks on dealing with these controversial issues in an artistic way? And if so, how do you deal with it when the concerns may come from those who maybe did not or will not see the performance or rendition? Well, first I will address it um, in a sense um, with folks that are going to see the performance. Um, because sometimes I do get a little bit of pushback from an audience that might be um, uh, leery of, of being sad. Oftentimes um, an African American audience or an African American audience member um, might be hesitant to come to the show because they're worried that um, that that they will leave uh, feeling depressed about our history. But I'm confident in the work uh, so much so that I I simply either. Um, talk to them before the show or uh, they eventually come to me after the show to tell me that they were leery of coming to the performance but uh, were able to enjoy themselves because um, of the way that I do utilize <clears throat> humor within the piece uh, or the pieces that I do. Um, but yes, I do get folks that might have issues and are not coming. Um, in the early years of performing Emmett Till in Mississippi, I received death threats. And the only way to deal with death threats is either two ways. Cancel a performance because I am scared of dying or continue to have the performance knowing that what I do is, um, is very important. I'm a conduit. Um, the words that I speak are the words that others have spoken in the past, and my, my message needs to be heard, and so therefore I, uh, I push on through. And so I've never canceled a performance because of, of pushback. And I think too, you know, um, I think that's an excellent question, and I think part of it is how you set it up. You are inviting folks to a discussion, not a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I recommend is get your partners, you know, partner with, I keep going back to libraries, I love the libraries, but partner with, you know, like Hallie did, the, the schools. Um, get folks on board, get your partners in place. And also, going back to what I mentioned about having a scholar or an expert there, you know, having someone who can um, address the, the, the truth and the facts that's within that history. But, you know, ultimately I think if somebody isn't pushing back, if somebody isn't fussing, then you're probably not doing something right, you know, because this, these types of controversial issues are what we need to learn to discuss in safe spaces mm -hmm. in society as a whole, I think. Wonderful, thank you. And Hallie, we do have another question for you, which was, where can people find access to the information that you provided on um, Now is the Time and the book, How Long Will I Cry? Sure, you can go to um, bigshouldersbooks.com and say that you are a part of listening to this webinar, and you can get a free copy of the book, How Long Will I Cry? Voices of Youth Violence. Um, and I believe Christine has that information as well that she can put forward. Yes, so we will have all of this. We currently have the Now is the Time report available on the website that you all registered on. And then we will also be putting the link to How Long Will I Cry? And of course, we have our contact information if you have further questions. Um, about any of the programming that we talked about today, or if you have ideas for future programming that, that you would like to collaborate on, we welcome um, any and all of your, of your feedback. So thank you so much to Mike and Christy and Hallie. I really appreciate you sharing all of the excellent work that you do with us today. Um, and I think that we are going to go ahead and wrap things up. Great. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the American Bar Association, the ABA Division for Public Education, and the ABA Center for Professional Development, thank you for participating in this program. To learn more about the sponsors, visit the ABA website at www.americanbar.org. 
thank you, and please click on the evaluation link. We value your feedback.